In this video, we'll look at the notes for section 4.6, which is called diffusion in a disk. For this problem, we consider a disk of radius capital R in the plane. We make several assumptions about the temperature of the disk. First of all, we assume that the temperature after t units of time is a function of the distance r from the center. So we imagine that we're looking at a circle which is centered at the origin and we describe the points using polar coordinates. We're going to assume that the temperature at any given time is a function of how far away you are from the center. Assume the temperature along the boundary is held at zero degrees. So the temperature along the boundary is always zero for all time. Our third assumption is that we will assume the initial temperature of the disk is a given function of r. So u at r comma zero is f at r, where f at r is some given prescribed function for all r inside of the disk. We'll also assume that u is bounded on the disk. That's our usual assumption. The heat equation in two dimensions is given in terms of the Laplacian. The partial derivative of u with respect to t is equal to some constant times the Laplacian of u, where in rectangular coordinates, the Laplacian of u is the second derivative of u with respect to x plus the second derivative of u with respect to y. We found a formula for the Laplacian in polar coordinates before, and here it is. The Laplacian of u is the second derivative of u with respect to r plus 1 over r times the first derivative of u with respect to r plus 1 over r squared times the second derivative of u with respect to theta. In our particular example, we're assuming that u only depends on r and t, so there's no dependence on theta. So that means that the second derivative with respect to theta of u is equal to zero. And so in this case, our Laplacian takes on a very nice form. Therefore, the heat equation, in this problem at least, looks like this. The partial derivative of u with respect to t is equal to our constant k times the Laplacian of u, which is now u sub r r plus 1 over r times u sub r. This gives us the following diffusive initial boundary value problem. So here we have our heat equation u sub t equals k times the Laplacian of u in polar coordinates where u doesn't depend on theta. So it's u sub r r plus 1 over u, 1 over r times u sub r. We also have our boundary condition that at all times along the boundary, so u at capital R comma t, our temperature is zero. And we have our initial temperature u at r comma zero is given by prescribed function f at r. We further assume, as I mentioned earlier, that u should be bounded on the disk. Boundedness is our usual assumption. So we're going to use separation of variables. We let u at r comma t be a function of r times a function of t. So in this case we're going to call the function of r y and the function of t g. So we can compute the derivatives and the differential equation, which is the heat equation, on the left we have the derivative with respect to t, which is now y times g prime. And on the right we have our constant k times our Laplacian. So it's the second derivative with respect to r, so we have y double prime times g plus 1 over r, 1 over r, times the first derivative with respect to r, so it's y prime times g. Notice that we can factor out a g on the right-hand side. There's a g there and a g there. So we can factor out that g and divide by g, and that puts it over on the left. We also divide by our constant k. So there's k, but we put it over here. We leave the g prime on this side, but we divide both sides by y. So this y ends up in the denominator over here. And of course this means we've managed to separate our variables. On the left side you have a function of t, and that's equal to the right side which is a function of r. And as usual if you have a function of t equal to a function of r, then they must be constant. 
and as usual the separation constant is minus lambda. So now we have two ordinary differential equations. The first one, the one on the left, is obtained from the function of, of t, or the functions of t. You multiply k times gt over to the minus lambda, and then you have g prime is equal to minus lambda k g. We know what this general solution is for a differential equation of this type. It's exponential. So g at t is some constant times e to the minus lambda k times t. So this minus lambda k is that, excuse me, is that minus lambda k right there. That's our first differential equation. That's our differential equation a. But we also have a differential equation b, which is right here. And that differential equation is obtained in the same way. You multiply the y at r over to the other side, and then you have the numerator, y double prime plus 1 over r times y prime, is equal, so that's this part, the numerator, and that's equal to minus lambda times y at r, as we have there. So perhaps I should color code this differently. Let's just color code this a little bit differently. So the y part is green, so because that's the same yr right over there. And the g is right here. So perhaps when we talk about the solution to a, we say g of t is equal to e to the mi c times e to the minus lambda k t. So it's that lambda k there. Okay, so now let's look at b. Let's look at the differential equation b here. So the equation in b is a sturm liouville differential equation. To see this, multiply both sides by minus r, and you end up with this equation. So you start with y double prime plus 1 over r times y prime equals minus lambda y. Multiply both sides of that by minus r. So this minus sign right here is that minus sign right there. So you multiply the first term by r to get that r. And 1 over r times r uh, cancels, and you just get 1. And then you have an r over here. Now we're multiplying by minus r, so you gain a minus sign here. But this minus sign disappears, and so we have that. Now on the left, this is the result of a product rule, as you can see here. r times y prime uh, primed. So the derivative of r times y prime is r times y double prime plus y prime. So here we see that we have a sturm liouville differential equation. This is actually known as Bessel's equation. And the solutions to this will be Bessel's functions, or will involve Bessel's functions, as we'll see. So the boundary condition is u at rt equals 0. But u is y times g. And we don't want g of t to be equal to 0 for every t. So that just means that y at r is equal to 0. So we now have the following singular sturm liouville problem, which you can see here. So this is the Bessel's equation. And we have y at r is equal to 0. It's singular because of the origin. So we don't have a value for it on the origin, just we're assuming that it's bounded as we get to the origin. Notice that we have this r to the right, so this is, this is a weighted problem. This is a weighted problem. It's singular because of that r right there. Let's just highlight it. So it's singular Sturm-Louisville differential equation. Well, Sturm-Louisville problem, really, but yeah, let's just call it SLP. It's a singular SLP because P at R is equal to R, right there. And of course, P at zero is equal to zero. So that's what makes it singular. And it's also weighted because there's another R there. So it has weight R. Perhaps we'll just highlight this one as well. So this DE has weight R. All right, so we have a singular 
SLP, as you can see here. And again, we're assuming that it's bounded on the disk, because specifically as you get closer to the origin, because that's the place where you might have a problem. You might have a problem at the origin because that's when r is equal to zero. We want to solve this singular SLP. So you can show that it has only positive eigenvalues. And so we're going to take that for granted. To determine the solutions for lambda greater than zero, we use power series. So suppose that y is a solution that is written as a power series. So y equals the sum n equals zero to infinity, a n times r to the n, where these a n's are as yet undetermined. We write the differential equation in this way. This is back in the original way, although it's multiplied by r squared. So our original differential equation, if we go up far enough, perhaps I've went up too far, our original differential equation is right here. So I'm going to multiply both sides by r squared. So I'll end up with an r squared times y double prime plus r squared times 1 over r, which is just r times y prime. That's this equation right here. And then, of course, on the, on the right, you have minus lambda times r squared y. All right. So we're assuming that y has this power series form. So we compute y prime and y double prime, as you see here. We only multiplied by r squared just to make the computations easier. It makes everything look, ni look nicer in the end. So the differential equation, if you substitute in this y prime into this y prime, so this value goes right there, or right there, and this y double prime, that's going to go right here. And then you end up with what you see here. So you have the sum n equals 2 to infinity, n times n minus 1, a n to the r times n minus 2. But I'm multiplying it by r squared. I multiply it by r squared, so I have r to the n minus 2 times r squared, and that's going to give me r to the n. And that's really why we're multiplying everything by r squared at the beginning. So that way you end up with an r to the n minus 2 times r squared. Now, we started by differentiating twice. So we use the power rule twice. So that's why we have a sub n to the r, a sub n times r to the n here. You differentiate at one, the n comes down, and you decrease the exponent by one. But then you differentiate again, and then the n minus one comes down as well, and then you decrease the exponent by one, so you end up with n minus two. Notice that this starts at n, n equals one. The first term here, if we start writing this out, this is a, 0 plus a1r to the 1 plus a2r squared, and so on. So if we differentiate that, the first term goes away. So that's why here we're starting at n equals 0, but here it's n equals 1. And then if you differentiate it again, you're going to lose another term. And that's, so this, this a1 term, if you differentiate that, that just becomes a1. Differentiate that again, and it goes away, and so you're starting at 2. So that's why there's a 2 there. Okay, so the differential equation is what you see here. Now this one we talked about, we simplified it because you multiplied it by r squared. Here, this one is r times y prime. So I'm going to multiply this term by r. And again, I have the same thing. r to the n minus 1 times r gives me r to the n. Now on the right, I have r to the n plus 2. That's because I'm looking at y, and I'm multiplying that by r squared. So there's y, which has r to the n, and I multiply it by r squared, so I get r to the n plus 2. Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to give everything the same exponent. So I want this to be r to the n. So what that means is I'm going to shift my index. So instead of summing from n equals 0, I'm going to sum from n equals 2. So that means if I'm starting at n equals 2 here, I have to, that means I'm starting two steps later, but I need the same numbers. So this one, instead of being r to the n plus 2, is just r to the n. And this a sub n is a sub n plus 2. So if I look at the first one and I start at n equals 0, then I'm going to have a sub 0 to the r squared. And that's the first term here as well. If n equals 2, I have a sub 2 minus 2 is a sub 0 times r squared. So the terms are the same. I'm just shifting the index. Now this one, 
in the middle, I'm doing nothing to that one. What about this one? Notice I'm starting at n equals 1. Here I'm starting at n equals 2 and here n equals 1, but nothing is lost. Because if I substitute n equals 1 into here, I'm going to have a 1 minus 1 is 0. So I'm not adding in anything other than a single 0. So that's okay. Now this starts at n equals 1. This one starts at n equals 1. This one starts at n equals 2. So I'm going to combine these two terms into a sum that goes from 1 to infinity. So I have n times n minus 1 times a sub n times r to the n. And here it's n times a sub n times r to the n. Factor out the a sub n and factor out the r, sub r to the n. There's the r to the n. There's the a to the n. Everything that's left over simplifies. n times n minus 1 times n. So that's n squared minus n plus n, so it's just n squared. So on our left now, everything's simplified nicely. It's just the sum n equals 1 to infinity, n squared a sub n times r to the n. Now on the right, I haven't done anything for a little while, not since shifting the index. So these two sums are equal, which means that their coefficients must be equal. On the left, I'm starting at n equals 1, and on the right, I'm starting at n equals 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take out the first term. So when n equals 1, I have 1 squared is 1 times a sub 1 times r to the 1. That's this term here. So this term right here, this is the n equals 1 term. And then everything left over is the same. It's just n equals 2 to infinity. So the coefficients of these power series have to be the same. There is no there is no n equals 1 term on the right, so that means there actually can't be an n equals 1 term on the left. So that means that coefficient a1 has to be equal to 0. We also need to equate the coefficients for the other terms, so n equals 2 to infinity, so to speak. So for any n greater than or equal to 2, the coefficient on the left here, n squared times a sub n, must be equal to the coefficient on the right. So the coefficient on the left is n squared a sub n. That term, that's this one right there. But that has to equal this coefficient, minus lambda times a sub n minus 2. So solving for a sub n in terms of a sub n minus 2 gives us a recurrence relation. And it tells us what a sub n is in terms of a sub n minus 2. Now, we already know that a sub 1 is 0. So that tells us that any odd number, any odd coefficient, so to speak, any a sub n where n is odd will be 0. We know that a sub 1 is 0. And a sub 3, for example, a sub 3 will be equal to minus lambda over 3 squared times a sub 1. But a sub 1 is 0. Similarly, a sub 5 would be minus lambda over 5 squared times a sub 3. So that would be 0. So if n is odd, then a sub n is also is going to be 0. Now this is not true if n is equal to, to an even number. So if n is even, then your recurrence relation uh, you can be replied repeatedly and what you end up with is you have this a sub n equals minus lambda over n squared times a sub n minus 2. But then you just re repeat that inductively. And you end up with what you see here. a sub n is equal to minus lambda over n squared times minus lambda over n minus 2 squared, and so on and so forth. So you end up with this relationship here in terms of a0. Now at the bottom, in the denominator here, I just took out the square. So it's n squared times n minus 2 squared and so on, so I take out the square. Now all of these terms are even, so what we can do is we can let n be equal to 2k for k and n. And then if we do that, notice what happens. So we have a sub 2k for a sub n. Here in the exponent we have n over 2, well, if n is equal to 2k, then n over 2 is just k. And in the denominator, all of these numbers are even, so you can factor out a 2. Now you get a 2 from each term. How many terms are there? There are k of them. So you have 2 to the k times k factorial. 
but all of this is squared. This allows us to write a sub 2k in terms of a sub 0 for all k. Now we're just looking for a solution. So we're going to pick a0 equals 1, and this will give us a fundamental solution. So if you just pick a0 equals 1, then you're going to end up with, if you just plug that into your differential, your, uh, your power series, you're going to end up with 1. This is the a0 term. And then you have all these terms. This is just a sub 2k. k goes from 1 to infinity. So a sub 2k times r to the 2k is r to the n. So remember, n is equal to 2k. So that this is, this is n here. This is the nth term. This is a sub n, which is a sub 2k. Now, the same formula works if you pick k equals 0. So here we're looking at the, at the sum k equals 1 to infinity. But you can just add that 1 into it, into the sum, and that's the case k equals 0. So this is the case k equals 0. And so then you end up with this series representation for y. This gives us one solution to the differential equation. Now this solution is typically denoted using j sub 0, or more specifically, it's j sub 0 evaluated at r times the square root of lambda, where j sub 0 is this function here. So if you evaluate this function at r times the square root of lambda, you end up with what you see in this power series representation for y. This is called the Bessel function of the first type of order 0. It's of the first type because there's going to be another type. Uh, the order 0 part comes from the fact that there is a more general differential equation. So there's a more general differential equation that's known as Bessel's equation, and it's this differential equation here. Uh, notice that there's an m squared there. So I've written this in terms of x's instead of r's. So you have x squared times y double prime plus x times y prime plus x squared minus m squared times y. So there is no lambda here, which is why we ended up with j sub 0 at r times the square root of lambda. The fact that we have the square root of lambda here is a representation of the fact that there's no lambda in this equation. Now this m here gives us the order. The differential equation we were looking at had m equals 0. It was r squared times y double prime plus r times y prime plus r squared times y. Well, there was a lambda there, but there was no m squared. So in our example, m was equal to 0. So in our example, m is equal to 0. And that's why it's of order 0, because the solution to this differential equation is this power series. And this one gives you the function j sub m, which is the Bessel function of the first type of order m. The proof of this is exactly the same. It just involves a little bit more bookkeeping, because you have to keep track of this m. Notice that now we have 2 to the 2k plus m. And here we have k factorial times k plus m factorial. Now in our case, m was equal to 0, so this just ended up repeating, and that's why you had a square there. And this exponent on the 2, you should think of that as k plus k plus m, just like there's a k and a k plus m there. Here there's a k and a k plus m. But since m is equal to 0 in our example, you just end up with k plus k, which is 2k. So this is the Bessel function of the first type of order m. Now, why, why of the first type? Well, Bessel's equation is second order. So there is another solution that is linearly independent to j sub 0. And that is the solution which is called Bessel's function of the second type. In this case, it will be of order 0. Just like our first one was of order 0, our second one will also be of order 0. So since Bessel's equation is second order, there's going to be a fundamental set of solutions with two linearly independent functions in it. And we've established one, and that's the Bessel function of the first type, which we're calling j sub m or j sub 0 in our specific example. The Bessel's function of the second type is 
called Y, capital Y sub M, if it's of order M, we're only going to be looking at order zero again. So we can obtain the second solution from the first solution using reduction of order. So let Y be equal to this first solution. And let capital Y be some arbitrary function which I'm calling V, V at R times Y at R. Let's just call it VY. So this is the basic idea behind reduction of order. You start with one solution Y, and in order to obtain another in order to obtain another solution, you take that first solution y and multiply it by some arbitrary function v. So that gives us v times y. Now we want to plug this back into our original differential equation, so we need the derivatives. So y prime we obtain using the product rule, and y double prime, again, you just use the product rule. The middle terms, the cross terms, whatever you want to call them, double up. And so this is capital Y prime, capital double Y, or capital Y double prime, not capital double Y prime, but capital Y double prime. And we substitute these back into the original differential equation, which you see here. So Y double prime is this. So Y double prime is all that. So Y double prime is all that. And Y single prime is goes here. So it's that right there. So if you do that, you can regroup everything. So let's look at everything that has a, a V prime. So there's only one thing that has a V prime in it, and it's this R squared times Y, and that's where these come from. Now we group together everything that has V prime. So maybe I'll just switch this to a different color. And so here we have, there's a V prime, and there's a V prime. So you have, 2 times y prime times r squared. 2 times y prime times r squared. And over here, we're going to have a y times r, y times r. And now we also want to group together everything that just has a v. So there's a v and there's a v. So we end up with y double prime times r squared, which is that term, y double prime times r squared. And also, here we have a v times y prime times r, which is that term right there, y prime times r. Okay, what do we do with all of this? Well, this is going to be equal to the thing on the right. Now, notice that we had a y, so there's a capital Y, which is v times lowercase y. Now, at this point, we would remember what, what lowercase y was. We assumed that lowercase y was the solution to the differential equation. So y was the solution to the differential equation. Well, what was the differential equation? If we go back a ways, here's the differential equation right here. r squared y double prime plus r times y prime is equal to minus lambda r squared y. R, so let's just remember that, r squared y double prime plus r y prime. So if we come down here, notice r squared y prime plus r times y prime. r squared y double prime plus r y prime. So this is equal to minus lambda r squared y, which is exactly what we have right here. So here we have a v times minus lambda r squared y is equal to v times minus lambda r squared y. Now this is multiplication. This is not the argument of v. We're just multiplying them together. So it's v prime times that. It's v times, it's v times that v times that. So this term and that term are the same. So in particular, you can subtract them away and they both go away. So what are you left with? You're left with v double prime times r squared y plus v prime times 2r squared y prime plus r y. And this is exactly what we're hoping for when we use reduction of order. This sort of thing always happens because you end up canceling out everything that's got a v in it. So this looks like a second order differential equation because it has v prime prime. And it is second order in terms of v, but it's only first order in terms of v prime because there's no v here. So we can think of our function as v prime, and this is the derivative of v prime. So this is first order in terms of v, not v. This is first order in terms of v prime. So we can just solve it for v prime using the usual techniques, which we've done here. Now, I won't go through all those details. It's pretty standard. The only difference is that at the end, you end up getting v prime 
is some constant time divided by ry squared. And that's fine and all, except we don't know how to integrate 1 over ry squared. So we just end up integrating it. We can write it as a definite integral like that. That's our antiderivative. And since we only want one such function, we can pick a to be anything that we want, as long as it's not 0. So we pick a equals 1. That's why we put pick equal a equals 1 here, because we're just looking for one such function. Now, similarly, this is a general antiderivative, and this is a particular antiderivative. So really, I should have a constant of integration here. So it should be plus constant. But again, I'm just looking for one such function. So I can pick that constant to be anything that I want, so we just pick it to be equal to 0. Pick equals to 0. And that gives us a function v. Now, we don't know explicitly what that function is. We've written it as a definite integral, that definite integral. So v at r is equal to the definite integral from 0 to r of 1 over z times y squared dz. This is our multiplying factor. So our capital Y, which is going to be our other solution, that's lowercase y times v, which is this v. Now, lowercase y, remember what that was. That was this Bessel function of the first type right there. And that's the same y that's right there. So that's the same y. So this y and that y, th that's this j sub 0 and j sub 0 squared here. So this y and that y are these Bessel functions. Now we call this y sub 0, and this is our Bessel function of the second type. So our we now have two linearly independent solutions to the differential equation, so we can write down our general solution. Now, we don't really know what these functions look like, j sub 0 and y sub 0, uh, but you can evaluate them numerically and you can plot them. So it might not be obvious, but y sub 0 is unbounded as r goes to 0. So we can actually get rid of this term. You can look at the graphs here. This This is uh, j sub 0 and y sub 0. So y sub 0 is this green one here, and j sub 0 is this blue one here. Now both of them are oscillating around 0, but y sub 0 has a has a vertical asymptote here at at 0, at z equals 0. So as z goes to 0, this thing decreases to uh, to negative infinity. So it's unbounded in particular. We want our solution to be bounded, so we have to get rid of this unbounded term. So we get rid of that c2. So c2 equals 0. j, j sub 0 is fine. This thing behaves like a decaying cosine. So you can see that it starts at 1, and then it oscillates while decaying. So it has infinitely many zeros. So here's one, here's another one, here's another one. It just keeps crossing the x-axis infinitely many times. I suppose this is the z-axis this time, z-axis, because uh, we're using z as our, our uh, independent variable. So this is just a picture taken from Logan's text. So our other, our other boundary condition is that y at r is equal to 0. So that means that y at r, y at capital R, is c1 times j sub 0 evaluated at capital R times the square root of lambda. Now c1 is not going to be 0, because otherwise we have a trivial solution. So that means that j sub 0 must be equal to 0. So this number right there needs to be a 0 of the Bessel function. So this r times the square root of lambda, that needs to be a 0 of the Bessel function. Now, there are infinitely many of those. There are infinitely many of those. Here's one, here's another, here's another, here's another, here's another. Now, I don't know what the actual values of those are, but let's just list them out. So we have a solution for each zero. So let the zeros be labeled z sub n. So those are the zeros. There are infinitely many. There, there's countably many. They form a sequence. And so we want r 
times the square root of lambda to be equal to one of these. And it can be every one of those zeros for different values of n. So we let lambda n be equal to, well, I guess what I should say is we want, since we want that to be a zero, then r times the square root of lambda is equal to z sub n. So then you divide it by r. The square root of lambda is z sub n divided by r. And then you square it, and that's where that comes from. So we end up with lambda sub n is the zero of j sub zero, the zero of the Bessel function, divided by r, and then we square it. And that gives us our eigenvalue. So for each n and n, we have an eigenvalue. And the corresponding eigenfunction is this Bessel function, this Bessel function of the first type of order zero. So for each n and n, we have a solution, u sub n equals g sub n times y sub n. Now, g sub n, remember, was that exponential term. That was quite a while ago that we addressed that. So the g sub n is an exponential term, and the y sub n is this Bessel function here. So to satisfy the initial condition, we look at a, a arbitrary sum, or an arbitrary linear combination of these u sub n's. So u at r comma t is the sum n equals 1 to infinity of b sub n, where this b sub n is just an arbitrary coefficient, times the exponential term times the Bessel function term. The initial condition is u at r comma 0 is f at r, whatever f happens to be. So we have that u at r comma 0 is, well, if, if t is equal to 0, if t is equal to 0, that just gets rid of this exponential term. So we have b sub n times j sub 0 at z sub n r over capital R. And this quantity is equal to f at r. So now what we're going to use is the fact that these Bessel functions form an orthogonal set. They're orthogonal with respect to the weight r, that is. That is to say that if you integrate any pair, you won't necessarily get zero, but if you integrate a pair against r, you'll get zero. So j sub zero at z sub n r over capital R times j sub zero over z m times r over capital R times r dr is equal to zero. That, of course, is if n is not equal to m. So without this, without this r there, there's no reason to assume you'll get orthogonality, but they're orthogonal with respect to the weight r. So what does that mean? That means you can compute these bn's, because what we have here is a series in terms of these Bessel functions, and we just want the coefficients. We know that this series is equal to f at r. That was our initial condition. So we want to strip off the coefficients from, from this series, and we use orthogonality to do that. So b sub n is going to be the integral from 0 to r of f at r times j sub 0 at z sub n times r over capital R times the weight function r dr. So that's going to give you the coefficient. We divide here by the weak norm squared. That's to normalize it. And that's why, and that's why you end up with bn. You just do that. You divide by this norm squared to normalize it, just like we usually do. So I just mentioned there that that's what this is the definition of the of the uh, weighted norm squared. I think I said the weak norm squared a moment ago, but that's because there's there's this w here. I want to say weak, but uh, w stands for weighted in this case. So anyway, this gives us the solution. We know what u is because u is right here. But now, so let's just rewrite it. So our solution is u at r comma t equals the sum n equals 1 to infinity of b sub n e to the minus z sub n squared kt over capital R squared times the Bessel function of the first type of order zero evaluated at z sub n times r over capital R, where the bn is given by this formula right there. So bn is equal to uh, one, let's put the one over the weighted norm here. 
J0 Zn R over capital R. So that's the weighted norm squared times this integral from 0 to R, F at R, J0 Zn R over capital R times R dr. And there we go. So this is the solution to our problem of diffusion on a circle. Something that's very interesting is if we compare this to our previous problem where we were looking at the cooling of the sphere. The problem in, in its conception doesn't seem all that different, but the solution is quite different. With the sphere, we made a simple substitution that allowed us to solve the differential equation very easily. It was just a simple case of separation of variables. Here, on the other hand, we started with separation of variables, but the problem became increasingly more complex as we went along. We looked at power series solutions. That only gave us one solution, so we had to look at another, we had to find another solution using reduction of order. And that gave us a solution that we didn't even write as a series. Instead, we wrote it as, an, as a definite integral. So the problem became quite complex as we went along, even though in the framing of the problem, it's not all that different looking at temperature diffusion on a disk instead of a sphere. But in practice, as you do these computations, you can see that the problems are very different indeed.